Aloha, everybody. You guys there? What a beautiful day it is today. What a beautiful day. <sighs> I'm just stoked to be here. Been working on um, some new ideas. Been working on trying to come up with some solutions. And uh, I've posted prior to this live video. <sighs> Tony, what's up, buddy? First one here, bro. Number one. You're the best, brother. Oh, it comes number two, three. We're all filing in. Thank you so much for being here, guys. I, I think I got some cool stuff for you today. And um, I'm stoked to be sharing it. You know, I think maybe the first thing I can do is start off with... If you see behind me right here. Can you guys see this tree behind me right here? See, that's the woo-woo tree. That there. I know what you're thinking. You're like, the woo-woo tree, George? the heck is a woo-woo tree? Well, the woo-woo tree, my friend, see the branches on that tree? They're pretty thin, right? Like if I was to climb up that tree and try to hang on one of the branches, I'd probably fall down. And I'm thinking that that is quite possible. Like it's not, that's quite possible of my argumentation today. <laughs> so my arguments are on the woo-woo tree. We're gonna go way out on one of these limbs right here because the arguments I'm making, the examples I'm using don't have to necessarily be true to get the point across. That's my, my objective of the woo-woo tree here. So before we get started on the woo-woo tree, I wanna introduce you guys to a new concept. We talked a lot about language on this. On, you know, you, me, everybody in the chat, we've talked a lot about language. And one of the things we talk about language is is having new words, a new vocabulary, and being able to express ourselves better. One example that brought me to this next idea is the idea of schadenfreude. Are you guys familiar with that? Schadenfreude is a German word that means you are happy when, someone, when something bad happens to someone you kind of don't like. So they have one word for that whole concept. And a lot of other languages have words like that. I think that that's one thing that's kind of lacking in the English language. So I would like to introduce one of those words. For the record, I think this came from Matt Hatton. I wanna give credit where credit is due. But I would like to introduce you, all of you, to Chachi, right? Remember Chachi from like Happy Days? Okay, I'm gonna turn Chachi into a concept because you know what Chachi is not? Chachi is not the Fonz. The Fonz is pretty cool. Chachi is not the Fonz. Thus, Chachi is not cool. So, you know, whenever you see someone that has hubris, whenever you think of corporate greed or arrogance, any conversation that kind of wades too deep into the muddy waters of materialism, you know what I mean by that? When people, when people start talking about all the stuff they have or like, they, hey, come check out my Ferrari or that kind of stuff, like that's Chachi. And so if there's a lack of empathy or if there's ignorance, that is also Chachi, you know, the way I've been using it is like, you know, someone, if you're in a conversation and someone just for no reason kind of puts you down, I just tell them, hey, beat it, Chachi. You know, if you're in a meeting with someone and they're just clearly saying things you know aren't true, you just tell them, hey, look, you ain't got to lie to me, Chachi. You know, if you, for the girls out there, if you get some guy that's like hitting on you way too hard, just be like, hey, take it easy, Chachi. I don't need that right now. Sometimes we get people that call us too much, you know, like you, you just called me five times. So on the sixth time you pick up and you're like, hey, take it easy, Chachi, hang up. So we've kind of introduced Chachi a little bit. Uh, my previous podcast was quite a bit about Chachi and my interview of a corporate CEO. If you get a chance, you might want to check that one out there. So moving forward here to the woo-woo tree. This is gonna, this is kind of high octane speculation, philosophical speculation, but if you look at the nature of our planet and the nature of our evolution, it seems to me it's kind of fractal. And I tried to post up some pictures to show you about that. Like if you look at the post, you'll see, I think that you'll see just a repeating pattern. You know, and the, the big picture is the same as the small picture. And that's pretty much what the fractal is. Another example would be if you look at the map, if you look at like a topo topographical, is that the right word? A topographical map? And you can see the, 
the peaks of the mountains, those correspond with the shorelines of that particular, whether it be a lake or whether it be the ocean. It's pretty amazing to, to look at that. And what that does is it allows you to understand like kind of the nature, the fractal nature of our environment. You know, I, <sighs> I'm, I'm kind of reminded real quickly here of uh, the great philosopher Bradley that said life is too short, so love the one you got because you might get run over or you might get shot. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? I don't know why that song just kind of came into my head, but it's, a, it's pretty good, right? Okay. So back to the fractal nature of our humanity. We know that mountaintops correspond with coastlines. We also know that history doesn't rhyme. I'm sorry, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And that's, that's also the way our planet moves through the galaxy. Like, you know, you think we just do this, but we really corkscrew. We're corkscrewing through the galaxy. So we're, we're spinning, but we're never spinning in the same revolution. And it's important. That's important because you're not repeating the cycle. You're actually moving forward in a similar pattern. And there's a difference there. You know what I mean by that? If you were repeating it, you'd hear the same song over and over again. But if you were moving forward in a similar pattern, you would play the record all the way through. And that's what we have to do as our society. Does that kind of make sense? I hope so. And so I'm going to tie that together with our society right now. If you look at the leaders in our society right now, like they're all, they're all kind of boomers. And if you look at the, the ideas of our society, they're all boomer ideas. Right? The great symbols of our society in the last 50 years are the rocket and the bulldozer. Like they're pretty antiquated. You know what I mean? Those are the two biggest symbols of our, of our society. Like, in a way, it's kind of sad. But in a way, it's beautiful because we're going to move past those ideas. Right? And speaking of the rocket, like, what, what are we doing? We're already out in space. We're as far out in space as we're going to get. You wanna go further? Like we're already on a spaceship traveling through space. So anyways, that was kind of a little meandering right there. You know, to move a little bit further on the, the ideas and symbols of our society and the, some of the ideas are, like look at Ray Kurzweil. That guy is a bona fide genius, but he wants to live forever. And look, I, I love science fiction. I read a lot of it. And I love theoretical ideas. But you can't live forever, Ray. And the more that I think about it, it kind of saddens me. Like, look how much money is being put into longevity, right? Like, people want to... And I think we're all going to be a victim of this. Like, the older you get, the more you wish you were the way you were in your youth. However, because the people leading our society right now want more than anything to be younger, a lot of them anyway, what we're seeing is their attitudes manifested in our society. Like, how much money is going into living forever in this singularity? Like, look, you can make a really cool recording of yourself and you can play it back to your great, great grandkids, but you're not alive. You're not going to live forever. You can't live forever. And why would you want to live forever? That's ridiculous. How many insights come to the man who's about to face death? You could make the argument that, in fact, there are only certain truths that you can know when you face death. And anybody who's been close to death knows that. Anybody who's been touched by death knows that. Why would you want to deny yourself the, the, the knowledge of what happens? You know, in... in this funneling of profits and this ever dividing, this ever widening gap of division, it seems to me like people who are afraid to die. Like how many judges do we have that sit on a board of directors and also fill another responsibility as a consultant? You know, we have 
a lot of people in their 60s that are holding on to five jobs that all pay $1.2 million. Like, shouldn't you be looking for someone to hand the torch to? Shouldn't you be looking for someone to mentor? Like, shouldn't you be making peace with moving on to the next stage? And I, I look, I get it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite 50. And I know that I am going to continue to change and see things different. However, that's what I'm seeing now from our society. I'm going to get a shot of water here. Another point that, that kind of got me thinking about this is, have you guys ever heard of the, uh, let me just look at my notes here because this one's kind of tricky. Okay. Have you guys heard of the theory of recapitulation? I know, I, I didn't really hear of it when I was a young man, but I've heard of it now and I'm gonna share it with you. And this is, this is one that's gonna be up on one of those. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great quote. It's so, tr it's so true. So this next theory, the theory of recapitulation is gonna be something that's way out on one of these limbs. You know what I mean? Like a thin limb of the woo-woo tree. But let me read it to you so you can, you can kind of follow along with me. The theory of recapitulation, also called the biogenetic law or embryo, embryological parallelism, that is a mouthful. It often expresses, it's often expressed as ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. This is the historical hypothesis that the development of an embryo of an animal from fertilization to gestation goes through stages resembling or representing successive adult stages in the evolution of the animal's remote ancestors. <laughs> Did you get all that? Should I read it again or let me try to let me try to put that in terms that I can actually understand. So if you think of the sperm eating the egg, like okay, the sperm kind of looks like a little fish anyway, right? But so the sperm meets the egg and then all of a sudden they become one and you have conception. Then cells begin to cells begin to divide, right? That is also theoret theorized how life on our planet began, right? The, like a single cell begins dividing and that begins the process of complex life as on our planet is theorized to have, to have started that way, so as in our conception it started that way. And then as the, as the I think it's called a bioplast, but as, as those cells move down the fallopian tube and attach to the, the, you know, the wall of the uterus, you know, the cells begin to divide and then the, the embryo actually grows, it's, it's first, growth pattern is almost like a fish. It has like little slits on its neck and it has a tail, you know, and then a few more weeks it starts growing arm buds, which represent us moving from the sea to the land. And then, you know, that sort of process continues all the way until, you know, I don't think your brain is fully formed until you're 25. And even, even inside your brain, you have what we call the lizard brain, like the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system and so it's an interesting theory to think about. And it kind of gives credence to, you know, the whole process of the fractal evolution. You know, like, like what happens above, so below. So, it just, I think it's important to think about that because you have to understand where we are if you want to know where we can go. It's so many of us are so disconnected. It seems like we just, we lost our way. You know, and we've, we've come to a point where the ideas that have worked in the past are no longer working for us. And people are beginning to get scared. People are beginning to, to just, some people are beginning to panic. You know, if you look at a lot of the chaos out there, I think that's a good a good segue into where we can go from here. 
And I think we, where we can go from here is start coming up with new ideas and reinventing ourselves. But to do that, I just want to take one more quick trip through the past. And that is, if you look at any society, or if you look at our history, maybe the, the history of the West, you know, you can tell who's in charge by how tall the buildings are. I know that sounds crazy. But if you think about it, you know, a thousand years ago, 800 years ago, maybe a little bit more, the biggest building was the castle. And who lived in the castle? The king and the queen lived in the castle and they, that was the form of government. And then shortly after the castle, then you had the church tower and then the church ruled like the biggest the biggest building was the cathedral and that's where the power lies and now you have the seat you know you have these corporate towers and that's where the seat of power lies now the tallest building it's it sounds so simple and it's clearly simplified however it makes sense the tallest building is the seat of power right we've gone from a king to a religious figure, to corporate power. And again, it's, it's, it's a similar form, but it's changed. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, here's an example. Like, let's say, you, let's say you're taking a beautiful walk down this country road and you stop off because you hear this stream and you walk down by that stream and you see a whirlpool, right? And you're like, wow, look at that little whirlpool right there. And it's just spinning around and spinning around and you just, you look at it and you're amazed. We've all seen a whirlpool, right? And then as you look at that whirlpool, you realize it's a form, like it's, there's water in there, but it's never the same water in there. You know what I mean by that? Like it, the water comes in and it spins out. It comes in and it spins out and you can, come back the next day and the whirlpool will still be there. However, the water in that whirlpool is not the same water. It's, it's been moved through there. Does that make sense? So the form is there, but the substance is different. You know, it, it, there's the, the parable of Theseus's ship, right? If you, let's say you have this gargantuan ship and you decide to sail across the Atlantic Ocean and you in your ship you have got these wooden barrels of whiskey maybe Jack Daniels or something I don't know what kind of whiskey would you put in barrels probably old whiskey anyways you have enough barrels in the bow of your ship to replace every plank on your boat and as you go on your tour the boat begins to break down and as the boat begins to break down you replace the bad planks with the planks from the barrels in the bow. And by the time you get to your destination, you have depleted the barrels and every plank on your ship has been replaced by a plank from a barrel. Is that the same ship that you set sail on? You've replaced all of them. The form is the same, but the substance is different. You know what I mean by that? I hope, I hope that makes sense because it, I think it's important to point, to point that out too. The reason that's important is because the next argument I'm going to make will be taking us out further onto the woo-woo tree. <laughs> You're going to like this one. I hope you, I like this one. I hope you do. Okay, so we've had... We've had religious figures. We've had divine rule. What we have now, you could argue that the corporate rule is based in science. And I know I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a ton of heat for this, but science is basically prophecy, right? Right, I know, I, I, I have all my friends that like, I lose them right here. Cause they're like, dude, what are you talking about you weirdo? It's not prophecy. Science is prophecy. Science seeks to make predictions based on past events, right? You with me so far? I know some of you are thinking, well, yeah, that's, that's what it is. 
Well, that's essentially what throwing magic chicken bones does. Look, I'm going to, I'm going to throw these magic chicken bones and tell you what happens. I know, I know, I know. Listen, George, it's based, you see, George, what you don't understand is there's laws in nature, George. Everything is based on laws of nature. And to you, my friend, I say, no, no, they're not. You, we don't know enough to know the laws of nature. It's pure hubris to say that we know, we understand the laws of nature, we don't. In fact, that's the problem with our thinking and the reason our society is the way it is now is because we think we know, we don't know. We don't know. Like we're barely out of the trees, I think. You know, answer me this, like, the, when you think of the different paradoxes of science and, and it's so, don't get me wrong, science is so beautiful and I love it and, and, and all my friends that are, that are balls deep in it, I love you. But why is it that science seeks to be time independent? Like they don't ever factor in time. Like, you know, the Schrodinger's cat exercise, like right? half the time it's dead, half the time it's real. You know what they never say? What day was that on? on th did they ever say, well, on Thursdays, it's always alive. And it wouldn't even matter because on Thursdays, every day, we're in a different part of the universe. Like, how does that affect us? Is, are we near a different magnetic field? You know, you know what I'm saying? They're, they try to be time independent. They try to be time independent and you can't, if you, if, if you don't adjust for variables, you can't get an answer, right? A squared plus B squared is C squared, but A squared plus D squared is not C squared, right? If you call my phone number, you get me. But if you change one number in my phone number, you can get someone across the world. How could we possibly pretend to practice this scientific theory when we can't even nail down the variables? You know what I mean by that? I hope so. I hope I'm making sense there. I kind of want to stay on the topic of symbols. I know I've, I've given you the great symbols of our time have been the um, bulldozer and the rocket. Like, what do you think the symbols of the next generation are going to be? I think that's where we need to start moving forward. We need to start thinking about new symbols. You know, the bulldozer and the rocket, what do they symbolize? They symbolize conquest. They symbolize destruction. There has to be better symbols and we have to learn to we have to learn to read our symbols better we need better symbols we need a better we need to introduce that into our language you guys have any what do you think the symbols could be i'm not sure Another part of our fractal evolution, I think, is our relationships. And I can, I wish I could tell you that this is how relationships are. However, I can only tell you how I perceive relationships. And at 45, I've, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of failed ones and I've had a lot of good ones. And I, I've seen my family members have good ones and bad ones. And, you know, I'm coming from a home where my parents got divorced getting to learn what happened and why it happened and making that interpretation and then trying to apply it to my life. I think I've come up with some, some pretty good answers. And, and let me just try to chart this course and bear with me because I've just kind of free flow in here. But it seems to me that somewhere along the way, we've decided that we've decided not to protect our women. You know what I mean by that? I'm not, ladies, I'm not saying you need us to protect you. I get it. You're, 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 strong, you're smart, you're strong, you're capable. And now more than ever you are. And, and I hope that there's equal opportunities. I, I, I do. However, is it not the man's responsibility to protect the very women that they love? I mean... 
it seems to me, like when I look at some of the women in my family that I love, like, I think that's what happened. I think that that's why there were failed relationships. Like if you see someone get into a relationship with a guy that is abusive, be it verbally or physically, like that guy's definitely not protecting his woman. But the woman learned to be in a relationship like that because she had a father that didn't protect her as good as he could have. I'm not, I'm not blaming him. You know, I'm just saying that somewhere along the lines, whether it be society or the advertising companies or the Rosie the Riveter, or we got this idea like, I think we got confused and, and we went from, from thinking women can do everything and then that being synonymous with men not having to protect them. You know what I mean by that? And I think that should be an important part of education. And since we're talking about education and we're moving forward and right now the face of education is going to change forever, I believe that you're gonna see a lot of schools not open and that the virtual learning is the learning that's going to happen forever. If anything, you'll see small groups of children go into institutions for a few days a week and it'll be a hybrid study. And you know, that might be a good way to do it, but rest assured, it's never going back to the way that it was. And I would like to suggest that part of every course should be a relationship course. Part of every course from, from, from kindergarten up, the boys should be told, look, this, this young girl over here, it's your responsibility to protect her, right? And that means that if you hear someone saying something to her, or if you, if you see someone attack her, like, first off, don't ever be that guy. Yeah, I, I, look, I get it. Some, sometimes you should probably stay out of people's business. Sometimes people say things that they deserve to get jacked or whatever, but just don't do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Listen, they might, they might, what is the old Chris Rock joke? There's a reason for everything. There's a reason to throw an old man down a set of stairs. Just don't do it. <laughs> it's so it's good advice. But I would submit that that is part of the education process moving forward is reestablishing values. You know, so much of our values have been bought out. So much of our values have come from scientific materialism where we just decide that, you know what? I know that I shouldn't be doing the PR from Monsanto, but dude, I got a kid to feed or man, how am I going to pay for my house? You know, it's, it's essentially replacing morals with money. You know, I think we could restructure values by changing the monetary system, right? People, you know, we, if you look at the executives on Wall Street or if you look at people in positions that make a lot of money, they often talk about retaining talent and how much money it costs and they speak of sacrifice and they have decided to say to themselves, whether it be honest or not, they have decided to say that we need this much money to retain talent. We need this much money to do this. Otherwise, people won't want to do it. You need that incentive. But I disagree wholeheartedly. I think that people rise to the top for change, not for money. You know what I mean by that? Like, have you ever seen somebody that loves what they do? Like they get up and they do it every day and then the money comes to them. They're not doing it for a paycheck. In fact, if you're doing something for a paycheck, you, I know, cause I do it. Every day you get up like a little piece of you dies. Like you have to leave your family and then go do something that, you know, is, is, hopefully great for the community that doesn't cause any harm, but you're leaving the very people you love to get some sort of sustenance to make them better. So I would, I would submit to you that people work for change and not for money. And that those kind of values should be instilled in, in the, next, the next wave, the next form, the next whirlpool of education. Because right? education is changing. And education as we know it today is a form of education. The institution is a form. The, the university system is a form. It's its own whirlpool, right? So education as a whirlpool will still be there, but the, that institution is leaving. And a new form is coming in. 
Which brings me to an idea that I think can create change. Like, I've been very fortunate lately and I've been very thankful to get to have so many people listen to a couple of my ideas. And I've been talking to a lot of younger kids at my work, a couple younger kids on my route. Some of the kids on my route are, you know, they got nothing to do because they, everything's shut down. What if, and I know there's some of you guys on here. Um, I see some of you guys, like I talked to Darren and, and Justin and all these guys, you guys have a pretty big following. What if we each had two mentors or what if we were a mentor to say five kids and then once a month we had a, de- a semi debate, not really against each other, but we could have people submit questions about the future. Like for instance, what do you think is the most important part of education in the future? And then, you know, maybe I have four kids that I talk to and then those four kids go on and they, they present their answers to that question. And then Darren or Justin or anybody on here, like if you have some, some people that you're mentoring right now, then we should take time to provide this new form of online education. We can be the education that the future needs because who knows better what you need in your community than you, right? And if you, as someone who has, is fortunate enough to have some resources and have some time and have the ability to speak clear and well to younger people and they find you worthy of, of listening to, then we should come together and you know once a month just present, hey, here is my team. Here is the, quiz- the questions presented to my team. And then maybe the young kids I'm mentoring can ask the kids your mentoring questions. You know, we could establish a new network. We could establish this network of people between cities, between strangers, and come up with ideas from different parts of the world that we never thought were possible. You know what I mean by that? Like different cultures have different solutions to different problems. Different cultures have different solutions to the same problem. And I think when you start to understand someone else's point of view, I think when you can hear someone from a different part of the world explain to you why they think this thing is important, that you may think is insignificant, it can fundamentally change the way you think. And if we can fundamentally change the way we think, we can fundamentally change the way we talk and we can fundamentally change the way we live. So that's a big part of what I've been thinking about. And like, I've, I've been so lucky to talk to you people, like all of you, I've, I've got, I go on your pages and I check stuff out and you guys are doing such amazing things. I thought I would just try to reach out to you and, and see what you thought about that idea or how we move forward with that idea. I've already, I've been doing it. I have a couple young guys that I mentor and I've, I'll give them a book to read, you know, or I'll sit down with them and just ask them, how's your family? Like, what are you doing? What are your kids doing right now? How is your relationship with your wife? Or what do you guys talk about? And why do you talk about that? And you know, it's pretty personal. I get it. Some people might not want to share what that is, you know, but um, it's important, especially now, especially now. I've had some people talk to me that their kids had gone to school and now their kids are out of school and they get this optional online assignment and the girl I was talking to said, my, my kid's done with that assignment in like 30 minutes. She goes, that makes me wonder like, what, what were they doing at school? If my kid can do the entire assignment in the day in like 30 minutes, you know, what were they doing there? And that begs the question, what the heck are we doing as a society? Why do we put our old, the kapuna, why do we put the wisest people into old folks' homes and then us lunatic middle-aged people, we go work for somebody else and we drop our kids off at another institution. It's like the whole disintegration of the family. Like no wonder things are so messed up. We've lost the family unit. We have lost the very unit that, that gives us our humanity. With, if that structure is gone, you know, it, it, it can't be replaced by the state. It can't be replaced by, by, by anything. Your family is your family. And some of us have a bigger family and some of us have a smaller family. You know, it doesn't mean you can't, 
You know, the one thing I love about Hawaii is that everybody's an uncle, everybody's an auntie. You know, the culture still understands that it does take a village. The culture still understands that, hey, don't be afraid of your neighbor. Hey, that guy out there, go ask him what he's doing. Like, is that guy shaping a surfboard? Let me go talk to that guy. Or what is that guy? Dude, that guy has an amazing garden. Like, how does he kill all those bugs? How come I can't kill the bugs in my garden? You know, and you, you go talk to your neighbor and he's like, oh, bro, you got to put copper. You got to put copper down on the ground right there. It'll kill everything. It's like, what? You know, and especially now, especially with the, the people we have that are moving on, like, we're, we're going to lose a lot of wisdom. We're going to get rid of a lot of bad ideas, but we're going to lose a lot of wisdom. And for people our age, and by our age, I mean like 30 to 50, we need to be teaching the people younger than us. We need to fill the roles of mentors. We need to fill the roles of teachers. And we need to fill the roles of, of people that helped us. You know, I bet if you're honest with yourself, you can think about somebody in your life, be it a boss or a supervisor, an uncle, an aunt, a mom, a cousin. You had someone in your life that you looked up to, right? Maybe it was a TV character. I don't know. <laughs> right? Maybe it was um, the skipper from Gilligan's Island. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it was the professor. By the way, I think Marianne is way hotter than Ginger. I'm sure you all agree with me. But yeah, like, I want you to try to think of someone you admire and then be that person. Try to think of what, you know what I do? I try to think of what somebody smarter than me would say and then I try to say that. I try to think of what somebody a million times better than me would do to solve a problem and then I try to do that. It's a pretty good philosophy and I kind of enjoy doing it and it's kind of a fun experiment. Um, I, think, I, think, I think things are gonna get a little tricky, especially in the near future. Um, I think one thing about Hawaii, they have the coconut wireless. If you ever come to Hawaii, you know this. Be careful what you say because you live on an island and the word travels fast. It's really difficult to keep a secret in Hawaii. And so what I'm going to tell you right now is pure speculation. Like it's a rumor. It's all I know. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I'm saying that I have heard this. And what I have heard is that the airlines and the hotel companies, chamber of commerce, like they're suing to open up. Not only are they suing, but they're threatening to leave Hawaii. They're like, look, we're gonna just pull out and leave everything. This is all speculation, could just all rumor. I don't know if it's true. So I'm definitely point that out. This is probably, it's all speculation. I have no idea, but I heard this. They're talking about, listen, if you don't open by August 1st, we're just gonna leave everything. You know, it's kind of a form of like blackmail in that like, listen, you either you either let us make money, you let me sell this timeshare 1,000 times to 1,000 people, or I'm leaving. You know, and I, I'm not sure how to think about that. Like, on one hand, there's so many awesome people that work in the, the tourist industry, and like, Hawaii is so beautiful. I think people should come here and experience it. And, and like, I don't want people to find themselves in a position where they can't, fend for themselves or have an income because the institution that they work at is no longer viable. I get it. You know, and, and along with that comes, if you've been at a place for 30 years, like you have tied your meaning of your life to that place, like part of your soul's there. I, I don't wish to see anybody go through loss like that. On the other hand, like the corporate side of it to me is like, like, it's just so slimy. Like, listen, if, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to take my ball and go home. It's like, we'll take it then. Get out of here. You think, you think you're that important? You think you're that important that, like, you're going to ruin everything if you leave your big baby? Well, go ahead then. No one wants you here. That's the other side of what I think. You know what I mean? You know that guy that's like, I'm going to take this and leave. It's not fair. Like, that seems to me to be, like, the chamber of commerce and, like, the the CEOs of like these, these, you, you know what it reminds me of? Remember, remember uh, Paris Hilton's brother got on that plane one time, like a couple of years back and he just threw like that total temper tantrum because he couldn't smoke a cigarette and he started telling people like how inferior they are. Like that's what I think of when I think of the Hilton. I know, I hope I didn't ruin it for you guys, I'm sorry. It's totally what I think of. But like, look at that kid. 
Like his dad's an awesome mega millionaire, but a horrible father. A horrible father, you know what I mean? Oh, life is so funny sometimes. It give, life giveth and life taketh away. It has a sense of humor, doesn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I heard. And, and so if that's a rumor going around here, I'd imagine that there's also rumors going around where you live. And, you know, what if that happens? What if that happens in your area? Like, how does that affect housing? How does that affect the, the more importantly, how does that affect liability? Right? I think that that's kind of a big part of what all this is about is liability. Right? The insurance companies can't figure out a way where they don't have to pay people. And that's why no one can go back to work. And that's what the vaccine is about. It's like, listen, if we give everybody a vaccine, no one can sue the pharmaceutical companies. So we have plausible deniability and thus everyone can go back to work. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of ingenious. They could give you a shot of like... A B12 shot. Everybody gets a B12 shot, we'll tell them it's the antidote and bing, bing, bing. No liability. Because right now, if you go into a hotel or you go into work, if you go somewhere and you got COVID there, theoretically, you could sue that place, right? I'm not an attorney, but if you could prove you got it there, I, I think that there's grounds there. Or vice versa. Maybe the institution could sue you if you had it. So there's a huge liability problem that's, that's stopping things from getting back to the way they were. And I think that that's, that's one reason why you saw, like, obviously they're not going to tell us who the bailouts went to, but I think it's a pretty safe bet that you're going to, you know, it, it's sort of the AIG thing, right? Where the insurance insurance company is like not going to be able to cover everything. So I don't know, maybe this is a, maybe this is a good time to rethink insurance, right? Like it's kind of a scam, Right? Like, do you take, when you play blackjack in Vegas, do you get insurance? How about this? Like, what if, how about I pay my insurance all year and then if nothing happens, you give me that money back or you give me some of it back, right? How about that? Instead, they just, they just take all your money. <laughs> I'll share this story with you. I was at a, I was at a meeting a while back and it was a meeting of, of truck drivers. I'll just say that. It's a meeting of truck drivers and this insurance guy came in. And this guy, you know, it's, it's so sad. This guy comes in and he's talking to a group of men and women between the ages of 20 and 62. Some of the people in this group had been at this place for like 32, 33, 34 years. And in walks the insurance agent flanked on both sides by like upper division management people. And he decides he's going to speak to the group. And he says this to the group. He says... You know, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say thank you. You know, you, I know this sounds crazy coming from an insurance guy. This is the insurance guy talking. I know this sounds crazy from the insurance guy, but my main goal is that you guys all stay safe. I care about your guys' safety. And I have a family, and I know you have families, and I'm here today to talk with your management team about how to keep you guys safe, because that's all I care about. I don't care about money. I don't care about anything but your guys' safety. That was paraphrasing but it's pretty darn close to what that guy said and so you know i i had i had known about the meeting so i researched the company that the guy had and the company this guy came from a few years ago like the ceo of this corporation he was forced to step down because he came out public publicly and told every agent every adjuster that you deny every single claim regardless of its merit like the guy said that publicly so obviously he had to step down right and so I did some more research. And so after the insurance agent addressed me and this entire group of people, some of whom have given their life to this company, some of them who have had double shoulder surgery or double knee surgery or can't throw a ball to their son. Like he's, he just told all that. Like he said that he cares about their safety. So I raised my hand and I said, may I ask a question? And he said, sure. I says, you know, I think it's amazing that speech you gave him. Thank you. But I doubt the validity. And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, a few years ago, your CEO went public and told everyone that you, the, the agents and adjusters are to deny every single claim regardless of merit. Like, how do you, how can you work for a company like that and then come over here and tell me that you care about my safety? He just got quiet, you know, and then like, you know what I mean? Like when they get quiet, what do you do? You come with the other hand, right? You set them up with the left and then you come with the right hand. 
So I set him up with that one, dead silence. And then I said, additionally, you know, the number one injury at my place of work is a repetitive motion injury. Your company is spending millions of dollars trying to prove there's no such thing as a repetitive motion injury. Like, how do you, how do you sleep at night? Like, how can you come in here and face these people that have ruined shoulders and ruined knees and don't spend time with their kids and you tell them you love them and you want them to be safe and then you spend all your money trying to prove their number one inj injury isn't legitimate? <laughs> I'll tell you what, that was a great day. It was a great day, like, it ended up being like, scary for me a little bit, you know, cause there's definitely blowback from that comment. There's definitely blowback from there, but you know, it just made me be more aware too. Like I say dumb things a lot, you know, but if you're going to speak in front of a crew of people, you should be careful what you say. You should try to not step on people's toes. And you know, now that I said this, probably I'll probably say something super silly. And if I do, I'm sorry, but I forgot how we got here. I think because we were talking about insurance agents, but anyways, um, that's pretty much what I got for you guys today. Uh, I love you guys. I'm super stoked you're here. And let me know what you think about the setting up like a, a circuit of debates between possible mentor groups. Does that make sense? Like if you have a few people and we could set up a, I don't know, Saturdays at four, whatever the time zones are, we could, we could start introducing questions and ideas to younger people that will be able to take those ideas and make them better. You know what I mean? Like maybe we could set up a series of debate like forums to take the place of sporting events. It's kind of like a sporting event. You know what I mean? Like, how would you handle this? How would you do that? You guys are teamed up. But we could come up with a lot of cool ideas to help out the younger generation. Or, you know, we could, we could tell them, okay, you're, we could give them situational ideas. You're here. These people are saying this. What is the right thing to do? And uh, I think we can make a better world like that. And I think we can start talking about more solutions. So I love you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, welcome to the woo-woo tree. There'll be more of the woo-woo tree where my arguments aren't, aren't strong enough to be held by one of the weak limbs. So anyways, check out the theory of recapitulation. If you are feeling happy, then just let, let your mind roll out onto your own woo-woo tree. You know, and I hope, I hope sometimes if you go way out on the woo-woo tree, you'll be like, woo, woo. You know what I mean? Like you have this new insight and you'll be like, whoa. So, and also remember Chachi, right? Tell Chachi to beat it if he starts creeping into your life. All right? I love you guys. Aloha.